Hi, everyone. This is Stephen at Catherine McCauley Center. And this is a tutor training for the shape of the hour. As you can see, I hope you can see I'm sharing the screen. Um, this is a video one to make it easy and convenient or convenient in any case. So shape of the hour is a best practices PowerPoint, um, giving you suggestions and recommendations and encouragement, I hope, because the tutors I've seen in their classes have done a great job of following this um, intuitively, instinctively. I think most people understand what a good class is. You want to focus on communication. So the student, the person you're tutoring, the goal is so they can communicate they can learn English, they can go to Walmart, Unity Point Clinic, their children's school or their school, or just be out and about in the English speaking world and make themselves understood and they can understand in especially oral skills, speaking, but also writing to some extent. This mainly focuses on side by side. That's our main curriculum, although you can adapt it for even emerging literacy and survival English and the more advanced classes using the readers. So these are suggestions, just like any good language learning. This is descriptive, it's not prescriptive. It's not what you have to do, you must do, but they're suggestions again and recommendations. So I hope it's more helpful. We have shape of the hour, so helpful hints. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Um, okay, next slide, we can move over. There we go. So like any language, English, we have two main basic tools. There is the function of language. Um, what does it mean? So meaning, and then the form, how do we, what is the grammar, if you will, of that? Or what does it look like? What does it sound like? So an example, a quick example, would be the simple past in English. Most languages, certainly Indo-European languages, have that function. I think all languages must, because the simple past is completed action, over and done with, which sounds like a fussy way of saying it, but it really isn't, because there are other forms and functions of the past tense. There's past progressive or continuous, there's past perfect, there's many other ways of expressing and talking about and writing about the past. But the simple past is the ED form, is the form for most verbs. Not all verbs, obviously. In English, like many languages, the more common the verb, the stranger it behaves sometimes, so we have two main branches for the simple past. We have just take the base form, the main verb, add ed, or we have many, 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 many irregulars, and they happen to be many of the most common verbs, see, saw, read, read, buy, bought, be, was, were. There are many, many, many irregular verbs, but helpfully, um, English, like many languages, the irregular verbs and forms are frequently the ones we learn faster and fastest. They're the more common ones that helps. Also, they are unusual, so we tend to remember those. Another interesting little factoid about English in many languages, the stranger the verb, maybe the rarer, the weirder the verb, the more regular it behaves grammatically. In English, you have a very bizarre verb like discombobulate. I discombobulate, she discombobulates every day. Um, we just add an ED. They discombobulated yesterday or last week, last month, whatever it was, at one time. So over and done with action, that would be the function of that form, which is the simple past, add ED, or it's irregular. Okay, so in all languages, including English, um, there is function, what is this aspect of language doing, and then the form, how do we form that? Mm -hmm. So in language learning in general, 
we want to go from the function. Maybe that seems counterintuitive, but it's better practice, a best practice to go from function to form. So bigger chunks of language to the more granular, maybe specific um, grammar, grammatical, you think of doing drills. So this can hold true for grammar itself. Um, we start with a big, big chunky language, um, verbs and nouns, all language, or at least the Indo-European languages and certainly English. We have nouns and we have verbs. We have um, subject and predicate. So Jesus wept is a full complete sentence in English, the smallest scripture, or Muhammad ascended or Buddha meditated, whatever it is. We have a noun, we have a verb, we have a subject, we have a predicate. And then verbs, as you probably know, you know instinctively as a native English speaker or user or tutor that there are kind of two main branches of verbs in English, not all languages, but in English certainly. There are verbs of being, so be itself, appear, seem, those kind of more cognitive mm, verbs. And then there are verbs of action, walk, talk, read, buy, eat, drink, those kind of verbs. So, and then there are verbs of um, cognition. So you think, you believe, um, those you can't really show someone. They're, again, cognition. So there are two main ones you can't see and ones you can see, actions. So those, those are the verbs, and that's what we'll focus on. So when you're in your class, you have your 55 minute, your hour long class, um, one of the recommendations is to change things up as often as you can. Sometimes you can't. I mean, it may only be two or one change, like a half hour, half hour, 20 minutes, 40 minutes in a class, um, two different activities. But if you can, it's a good practice, best practice to change activities every 10 minutes or so. So maybe four or five changes per class will keep it livelier. It'll lessen the brain load. It will give students, people, another different chances, different ways to work with this grammatical function, um, the function and the form, both. So a teaching strategy you can use, I will use those in the second half of this presentation when we're doing a, a Spanish class. So I hope I can model um, language learning in only 30 minutes, and it was only 30 minutes. I did that first, and now I'm doing this going backwards, but I did use some flash cards or flashing cards because it's online through Quizlet, but you can use cards, you can make those up yourself. They're very fast and easy, and they're kind of fun a challenge, you can make a game of it. So you could have a verb on one side, um, read, and then on the back, the simple past, read, um, buy, bought, see, saw, like that. Um, so people can know, or you can get cards and just have words in a sentence, and then the student has to put them in order, especially with helping verbs in English. This is really a good, good technique. I've used it for many years. Students seem to like that. Um, so they can just do that on their own and with your help, of course, but it's very good if you've set them up for that. If they know already, this is a way to practice. Where do you put did in a question, a yes, no question in the simple past? Where do you put do for a yes, no question in the present? Something like that. Um, an interesting factoid, another one for vocabulary, which is how side by side starts and the readers start every unit or chapter. Vocabulary is crucial, of course, in any language learning. When you want to learn well, you need to know the material and the most basic form is vocabulary, the words for things, people, places, things, and actions, verbs. But you don't want to give them too many. Another best practice, it's not in this PowerPoint, is eight to 10 words per class is probably the best, the most our brains can handle for most people at a time. There are exceptions. 
side by side will throw, you know, 20 words, 15 new words at people. That's probably not the best, but you work with what you have. Uh, most students seem to handle that pretty okay. The exceptions are being mammals, being Neanderthals way back when, perhaps, I don't know why, but human beings, we can handle more vocabulary with animals, family words, and foods. I don't know why, <laughs> that's just a little factoid. They, they, the famous they, scientists have done studies that animals and food words and family, words for family, are learned more quickly and people can handle more of those in a lesson, let's say. Next slide, here we go. So how to shape your hour. You can start the first five to 10 minutes. Um, I wouldn't say more than 10 minutes, but at least five, five minutes or so. Um, you can chat, just chat, even emerging literacy students. And I see most tutors do do this. And I encourage you to do this, to chat, use real English in the moment, real 3D, real live, real time English in the moment. That is so helpful. If only, th if, in, if you, it's not really a chat if you're just talking, but even if you're just talking, they're getting more input. They may understand and not be able to respond and that's okay, but try to, if a student is willing and can, and most are, it seems, want to chat. The good thing is even students who come from very difficult, challenging backgrounds and may not be literate, even in their own languages, frequently will know chunks of English, basic English, good English, solid, everyday, ordinary, Iowan English. How are you? What is your name? I am fine. It is nice, it is nice weather, she is nice, she is my mother, they, they are my parents. Some basic, good, solid English. So you can start with that, you can, um, you can chat for five to 10 minutes. It's even better if you can use some of the materials you've been working on. If not, you can, uh, if you don't know the student, you can get to know each other. Five, 10 minutes, how are you, where are you from, things like that. That is using the English. That is our goal to communicate. So communication, not perfection. That is the goal. Communication, not perfection. That is the goal. Thank you. Next slide. So after you converse, you're chatting with a purpose, then you can go to the book, I would say, that would be a best practice. Again, there it is on the screen. Um, our goal, the, the mountaintop, is to get what's in our brains and communicate that to someone else so they can understand what you, what you want them to understand. So even if it's faulty, even if the grammar isn't correct, so they're making themselves understood and they get their needs met, let's say, at a basic level in English. So even native speakers don't speak perfect English. What does that mean? There is no perfect language. <laughs> that would be prescriptive, not descriptive. So if you can make yourself understood, you can communicate, you get an A plus. Good on you, that's it. So here, speaking of grammar, these are some of the basics of the grammar of verbs verbs of action or being in English. And we work on tenses. Tense means time. So the time that things are happening or happened or will happen. So past, present, future in different forms. So we have the simple present. The simple present, I go, she goes. There's only two forms in English, lucky us, lucky students. Um, so we have the base form of the verb. So I read, you read, they read, the whole world reads. So the third person singular, the whole world in English is third person singular. He, she, it, you add an S, that's it. So that's the form, but the function is when do we use this? So every day, all the time, a habit. 
So I read the paper after dinner every evening. I go to bed at nine. I wake up at five. So that's simple present. She goes to work after taking a shower, fine. So that's a simple present. It's also an important tense because we use it for facts, for science, things that don't change. So cats are mammals, they're always mammals. So we don't say cats are being mammals, would sound silly, ha ha ha, that would, what does that mean? That would be a bizarre thing to say. Strangely, perhaps, with this tense, it's not as commonly used as often, perhaps, as the present, what side by side calls the present continuous, or I call the present progressive, but it's the same form, the same function, the progressive, the continuous. So that's good to know. The simple present, again, we use for habits, unchanging facts, which means science frequently. Um, H, what is that? H2O, hydrogen and oxygen make water or however that goes. I'm, I'm not a physicist, but you know what I mean. Um, is or makes, so we use simple present. I do know that, the grammar of it. And schedules, those are usually unchanging also. So the bus comes at five, the train arrives soon, um, something like that. So we also have simple present, we have simple past. So again, I had mentioned earlier, simple past are completed actions, usually one-time occurrence. She went to the store, she bought milk, she came home. Full stop, period, done. So those three actions, doot, 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 over and done with. So yesterday she graduated with honors. So look at, we add our D, not even ED in that one, because it already ends in an E, even simpler, just add a D. So that is a regular verb. It's not irregular. We just had a D or ED. Um, with honors, I bought the verb buy. So that is very irregular, but it's very common. So many even beginning students, side by side one students, even emerging literacy students, survival English students will know many, many irregular verbs already. They may not know their verbs. They may not know they're irregular, but they will know them and know how to use them even. You can ask, you can find out. They might know did, made, had, said, was, were, verbs like that. She was very happy, simple past. So present progressive or present continuous is ongoing action and it really emphasizes right now. What are you doing now? You're listening, I hope. Listening and paying attention and learning yourself would be my goal. Um, some helpful suggestions. So what is currently happening? We also, but you want to be careful, not necessarily write this second, but we also use this in English for currently. So you can say something like, she's taking French this semester. So semester started in the past and is ongoing and goes for a period of time, three months. So we can say that, it makes sense. We use a present continuous or progressive. The other thing to know about English, which is very difficult and challenging for many language learners, ELLs, English language learners, is English has many, 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 many auxiliary verbs and two-part verbs. That's why we say the three most important verbs in English are what? To do, to have, and to be, because they have other functions. In this case, we do have a helping verb, an auxiliary. I am listening, right? She is talking. They are playing soccer. They are playing tennis. You are learning. So we have two parts, not one part, two. So we have the verb to be and the verb in ing, the main verb in ing. So we can practice that, we can learn that. And the good thing again, is many students already know these as chunky language, chunks of language. What are you doing? I'm watching TV, I'm going to the store, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. If anything, many students know this too much, they overextend that rule and they use ING for everything. It's not quite right, but getting there. 
We also have present perfect. And this is a very, as a grammar nerd, I would say an interesting tense, an interesting form and function, because again, it's one of our famous two-part verbs. But this one, the helper is to have, I'm just talking form now, again, have, and then what we call the past participle. So what is the present perfect? Well, even the name has two parts. Present means what? Just what it says, present, something now, something about now, but also perfect always has a sense of before in English. That's what the perfect tense is. The perfect means it's already happened. That's why those frequently are in the ED form. They're the same as the simple past. Have you been to Mexico? There are many irregulars. So B is one of those weirdos that has an irregular um, past participle. Have you been to Mexico? That's the present perfect. Have. Has she gone to the store yet? That's a verb to go in the present perfect. What does it mean? It means she went before. We don't know when. We don't care. We care about um, she has gone and got the milk or bought something or she's gone. Have you been to Mexico sometime in your life? We don't know when. We don't care. That's why this is also called the indefinite past. We know it's something happened in the past. We don't care when, who, what, when, where, why so much. We just know something in the past. You've been to Mexico. You've had the real tacos. Um, you went to Puerto Vallarta. You love the beach. Sometime in your past. We don't know when. We don't care. We're just asking, have you ever done that in your life? It's part of your experience. That's the present perfect. There's also present perfect progressive. There's also past perfect. There's also past perfect progressive. So there's variations on these themes, but these are some of the basic, basic ones in English. Um, and then in side by side, at least, you're working on dialogue. So those oral skills, you also have writing. So they give you models. So you start with the function or the form. You start with the function. So you don't need to use the word indirect object pronoun. You don't need to use simple past. You don't need to even say that. It's just a matter of using it. And side by side, and even the readers, they kind of plunge you right into that. So you practice the forms. You change the subjects frequently. You change the verbs. But you use that same form you're practicing over and over again. So this we're not going to do right now because it's online. This is um, a video, so it's not exactly in person. That's not a, in person at all. It's online. So here we have. It wouldn't be a real class without true or false, right? So big letters, true or false. Well, you want to be careful whenever you say always or never. You know from your SATs, that's always a little red flag. So. Rules-based grammar is the most important when focusing on form. What do you think? That's false. So examples, just what I was saying, like side by side, give people examples. So did she go to the store? Yes, she did. Did they go to the bank? No, they didn't. Another true or false, drill and kill. As teachers, we use these kind of little um, sliding phrases. Drill and kill substitute. So just over and over and over again, um, variations on a theme, let's say. So we drill them, they say things in the same kind of pattern. Because that's language learning too, very important to get into those patterns. You can see good students, not everyone, obviously, but good students can see the pattern and adapt it and use it. That's part of their toolbox. That's how language works. So you don't need a dictionary when you go into Walmart. You already have the form, you've used it, you practiced it, you know it, so you can use it. You know, you use did, subject, and then um, base form of the verb. Did you go? Yeah, I went.
So drill and kill is helpful and easy and it's efficient. So just say this over and over and over again. I read, she reads, they read, the whole world reads. It doesn't require very much of you. It's in the book, there it is, it's in your brain. But it's a heavy brain load for students. It's a heavy, heavy brain load. Not that you shouldn't do drill and kill and you should do just these substitution exercises, they're called also in side by side. Um, it's not that you can or shouldn't do those. We do do those, but only to do those. That's why we want to break up the activities per hour, right? We want to do four or five if we can. And that's why you start with chatting. We're using real English in real time. And it's more fun and motivating and it's interesting. And you care about people, you want to know about people, just like you do with um, other native speakers. So here another true or false to improve accuracy. She went, not she goed or something, or not she she have gone. You start with fluency. Is that true or false? That is true. So to become accurate, you practice. Well, that makes sense, that's intuitive. But how? You focus on meaning first, the function. So we use this for actions over and done with, completed, no more. Yesterday, last week, last month, when I was 10. Not the form, we don't need to get into, we don't have to right away at least, say, oh, you had ED here or bought is, you can just say what is the um, simple past of by, or even just say past tense of by, good enough, good. You can chunk language, so you're learning phrases. You use common, everyday, good, Iowan, middle of the road, English. It doesn't have to be fancy, it doesn't have to be academic, you don't need to be a teacher. Um, it doesn't have to be slangy or um, hip hop song either. Just use your ordinary everyday language. That's what students need to learn. So this also, the way Side by Side already has this set up, but also with the readers, with survival English even, um, you can repeat a structure with writing it, with speaking it, without drilling so much. And it's not just drilling, okay? And it focuses on a task, it can, especially if you personalize. So tell me three things you did yesterday. There's simple past again. It could be past progressive. I was watching TV when the doorbell rang, something. I was eating dinner when my sister came over, something like that. Pretty sophisticated English, even though everyday English to help students get to that point where they can use it, where they can say that or understand it at least, even if they're not saying it. So, whoops, 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 whoops. So after you do that, then maybe, maybe substitution drills like this, the drill and kill, but these are really best after to help consolidate. That's why when your old Spanish textbook in high school or your French and university French, which you've forgotten because you never use it, that's why it's kind of a mistake <laughs> the way a lot of those are set up, where you start with what we call conjugations and you just do that over and over and over again. I remember that in Spanish, hablo, hablas, habla, hablamos, hablais, hablan. Could I use it in Mexico City? Not very quickly or fluently or well. So you really need to use it in like a real life situation or real life as much as we can in a classroom in 55 minutes. And again, side by side helps with this and chatting with a purpose certainly helps with this. It's using real English, real time again. So you wanna start with five to 10 minutes of conversation, that good input, and not just to look at it in a technical, way. It's not only that, it's just getting to know a person. That's what we want. 
you can review. There's also a, a well-known factoid. I don't know how accurate it is, but I think it is, that you need to learn something three times to really learn it. So you don't, it's not one and done, especially with something as complicated and difficult as language, using language, focusing on communication skills. Those are hard skills. As native speakers, it takes years and years and years, many years, of course, to become really fluid and fluent and adept users of our language. So chat with a purpose, review if you can, or you must. Eventually, sometime in there, it's good to review. However you do it, you could do it in the chat, you can do it with side by side, you could have them write something. You wanna work in the book, but a friendly reminder, the goal is not to get to page 385 next Thursday. It is not. These are not university courses. So the book should be a tool. It should help you and the student. And I think most tutors are treating it that way. They're not treating it as difficult um, intellectual challenges, let's say. That's not the point of it. So don't be too tied to the book. The book is a tool, again, that's to help you and the student. You don't have to get through the book in three months. That is not true. <laughs> the, the focus, again, and the goal is to communicate the best they can and to give them those tools. And the book can help. So don't forget there's a workbook. So do those, that'll help also, that'll give more input. Try to personalize the lesson. What did you do yesterday? Do you like chocolate ice cream? How do you make a tortilla, a real one? Have you ever been there? Did you like it? Didn't you like it? Oh, I went shopping yesterday, it was so crowded. Really? What is the weather like? Do you like that? So ask questions, open-ended questions, that's a good way. So you want to leave with what we call good washback or good effect. So someone feels good when they're leaving. And I see 99% of our classes, it turns out that way. It's very good. Students are encouraged, you're encouraged. So that's why people are motivated and they really can learn. Okay, well, that's all I have. Um, make sure to check out the it's going back, 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 back. Um, make sure to check out the part two of this, which is a Spanish lesson, which I try, and I think I do, model these very um, best practices, these best practices, which I've suggested and recommended to you. Um, notice in the Spanish, I never use the phrase indirect object pronoun. We never talk about singular or plural. I don't even talk about what it means in Spanish or English. We just use it. We can talk about meaning in a different class, perhaps, if we were going to learn Spanish, right? You want to have meaning also. Yes, that's important. But work on our function first, practice that, and then we can get into the form. And I do get into that in the Spanish. So chat with a purpose, go to the book, have fun. Thank you. Goodbye. Keep up the good work. Ciao for now.